Amen. Let us get ready uh, for the word of God. I want to come to you out of the book of Ephesians, the second chapter, verse number 10. And I'm going to speak to you this morning about being prepared to do or being prepared for a good work. Amen. How many know you are a good work? Amen. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Come on, you can get more excited about it. Say it like you really mean it. I'm, I'm prepared for a good work. Amen. A good work. Amen. And we're going to come out of Ephesians chapter number 2. And we're going to read verse number 10. Amen. And Minister Lorette, I'm going to talk a little bit about the process of salvation. Is that all right? And how that fit in. Amen. And so let's look at this verse here. It reads, Ephesians 2 and 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Amen? Three points that we want to talk about here. Us, me and you being God's workmanship, what it means to be created in Christ Jesus for good works, and then finally ordained that we should walk in them. Amen? The author of the letter of Ephesians, of course, is none other than the Apostle Paul, a Apostle who has been identified by Jesus to minister to the Gentiles. And a Gentile is any person who could not trace their roots to Abraham. In other words, if they could not trace their lineage to Abraham, they were a Gentile. Now we have to understand that this is one of the epistles that Paul wrote while he was in prison and he was writing to this church because the believers uh, had forgot where their real identity had come from. How many of you believe it's important for you to know where you came from? Well, Paul begins to work the scriptures and he says to them, for we or his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And this word, workmanship, uh, Deacon Bridges, uh, it is the Greek word, parmita, where we get our English word, poem, and it actually means uh, literature. Uh, it means art, but more personal preachers, it means a picture. And, and, and what it's saying here is that from the foundation of the world, God had something in mind for you. And, and what, it's, what it's saying here is that before you were born, you were already in God's mind as an artist has a picture in his mind. And how many of y'all know uh, when you're looking at a painting, and you're looking at an artist. How many of you know uh, the emphasis has to be on the artist and not the painting? Why? Because it, the, the, the painting is simply what is in the mind of the artist. And, and no matter how beautiful the painting is, the, the painting only reflects the brilliancy of the artist. Uh, the picture cannot paint, it can't draw. It's the skills, the talents, and the ability of the artist that makes the picture shine. And what God wants you to understand, it came about on a certain period of time that you came about in his mind. And, and he decided to bring you into creation. So as an artist putting together a masterpiece, woo! 
Come on, help me in here, y'all. In other words, when God decided to bring you into the world, now the word he uses here, Deacon Whipple, this word created, it's the same word that's used in the book of Genesis when God created the world. So now here's God creating you, bringing you forth. And how many of you believe that if God makes something, it can be below standard? How many of you believe if God creates something, there can be a problem with it? How many of you believe if God created something, the world would be able to fool what God created to believe that they were less than what God made them to be? In other words, if God knows everything, and listen what the Bible says, Deacon McGriff, it says of Jeremiah, said, he told Jeremiah that I knew you. When I formed you in your mama's belly, you, you, you got to love the Lord. He didn't say in the womb, he said in the belly. And what he's talking about, that the first word he formed, Deacon Thompson, simply means he dealt with your outer being, meaning he made a decision whether you was going to be black or you were going to be white. That you were going to be male or you was going to be female. If you wasn't going to be born in Africa or in Egypt. And then he moves on and uses a word called Anion. And that means he decided what century you was going to show up in. Tell somebody I showed up exactly when God scheduled me to come on the scene. See, in other words, you're not a mistake no matter what your parents may tell you or what you have heard out there. Didn't nobody get drunk and you became a mistake. You were birthed before the foundation of the world. If your birthday, April the 11th, 1954, before the foundation of the world, God decided that's the day that you was going to be born. Now listen, y'all. When you were born, because God is dealing with the Genesis account, the day your mother birthed you. Do you remember when God said he made light, he made trees, and he said it was good? The day your mother birthed you, God stepped back, looked, and said it is good because he or she came out exactly the way I wanted him to come out. No matter what your features are, you are exactly what God had in mind. And no matter how you see yourself, when God sees you, he sees a masterpiece. He sees something that's very, very valuable in his eyes. But here's the key to this. You can't meet this person until you go to the next work. Because God does a work to you. Jesus does a work for you. And the Holy Spirit does a work in you. I'm going to say it one more time because I feel the Holy Ghost now. I said God does a work to you. Jesus did a work for you. And now the Holy Spirit got to do a work in you. I'm going to say it one more time because I showed up feel the Holy Ghost right about now. I said God decided to do something to you when you was in your mother's womb. Jesus decided to do something for you when you was lost and buried in your sin. And the Holy Spirit said I'm going to do something in you because we done saved you and got you cleaned up so we're going to bring back your remembrance and what God did in Adam he's going to repeat it in you. And the Bible says, minister, that look at here, that, that, that now Jesus did a work, and Jesus' work is your salvation. The death, burial, and resurrection. Now, how many of you know everything that Jesus did, for you and I, he did it physically, so it could be implied to us spiritually. Now, what do I mean by that? How many of you know when you give your life to the Lord, you die in your sin. But how many of you know because Jesus died physically for you, you don't have to die physically? Think for a second. What if the day, because you dead in sin, what if the day you gave your life to the Lord, it required you to die? What would be the use of salvation? Because you wouldn't be there to live it. But the Bible says that, listen, you and I 
We were judged for our sins in Christ Jesus. We died in Christ. Huh? We were crucified in Christ. And we was raised with Christ. So in other words, everything that God did to Jesus, he did it to you. So in other words, instead of you having to die two times, you ain't got to die but one time. And this is why when you have a physical death, you're going to pass from death to life and tell somebody, I'll never die again. Tell them, say, tell, them to, tell them to die now so you don't have to die later. That's what God's trying to do. Jesus did a work to bring you alive in the spirit. Now listen, your birth is so real, the, 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 the Bible calls it a new creation. It says... You and I was created in Christ Jesus. Now, back in the early church, Deacon McClinton, they didn't call each other Christians. They called those who, about the way, they came about the way, of the way. However, the most common, well, let me clear up something here too. That doesn't mean it's wrong for you to be called Christian because that's exactly what you are. You are Christ followers, we Christian. But the Bible gives an interesting term of what Christians were referred to, and it was, they referred to as being in Christ, in him, or in the Lord. In other words, right now, people, it's one thing to be saved, but it's a whole different thing to be in the Lord. I'm going to say that again. You can be saved, and be in the church. You can be saved and be into yourself. But the right way is to be saved and placed in Christ. Paul used this term over 170 times. In Christ. In Christ. And why did he say in Christ? Listen to this, y'all. The reason he said what is because of 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. It says, if, if, if any man be in Christ Jesus, if, if, if any man, if he be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. Come on, help me, y'all. If any man, not if any man be saved, but if a man be in Christ Jesus, if he get in Christ Jesus, he must become a new person. Help me, Holy Ghost. If you get in Christ, you cannot remain the same. You must become a new creation. Because the new birth means something has to be produced that human being cannot produce. And it can only be attributed to Christ Jesus. And when I say you in Christ, I'm not talking about you in Christ like a, a, a water is in a glass. Or a soup is in a bowl. We're saying you are in Christ like a branch is in a tree or like an arm is on the body. In other words, you connect it in a way that his life flows into the new life. Because how many of y'all know when Christ saved you, he only saved the new you? How many of y'all know he's only Lord over the new creation? Come on, help me in here, y'all. How many of y'all know he's not Lord over your old man? But how many of y'all know he only saved the new man? But you have to crucify the old man. Anybody going to pray with me in here? The reason there's such confusion in Christianity is Jesus saves the new man and ask me and you to use the power that the new man has to crucify the old man jesus saves the new man who don't want to cuss but he doesn't kill the old man who love cussing folk out but he asks the new man to exercise lordship over the old man 
so that the old man no longer do what the old man do, but he bows down to the new man. I'm going to say it one more time. There's an old man still hanging around that love to be flirty and do things that's not in accordance with the word of God. Jesus said, I ain't got nothing to do with the old man. I'm going to leave the old man up to you. You're going to show me how much you love me by crucifying the old man. That's the cross you got to pick up. In other words, I'm not going to do nothing to stop the old man. You're going to have to want to do that yourself. So if you love the old man, you're not going to kill what you love. But if you love God enough, You'll start crucifying somebody ought to pray with me. The old man. Listen to what I'm saying. In other words, God is saying, in all nature I have cut off sin. How many of y'all remember that car called the uh, Cutlass Supreme? How many of you know they don't make them no more? Come on, tell the Lord, thank you. How many? But it was a nice car when it was going. But Cutlass Oldsmobile hadn't pushed out a Cutlass Supreme in about 15 years. But Brother Butin, there's still people out here who got a Cutlass Supreme. Anybody go pray with me now? In other words, God is saying, I saved you. That old man is cut off in day, but he's still hanging around. And for a while, that old man may act up and cut the fool for a little while. But over a period of time, he ought to disappear because ain't no more new old man being made. In other words, you will never see a new cutlass supreme. It's going to come a time that the move. 30 year old cutlass supreme bumpers done went bad, tired, bald headed. They're going to go completely off the scene. All right, all right. That's what God is trying to say. Don't tune up that old man. Don't get that old man an oil change. Don't rotate the ties on him. Just let him wear himself on out so the new man can rise. And then Paul say, I'm getting ready to close. Paul says, so we won't confuse this thing. Everything God has, he's placed it in Christ Jesus. Meaning, if you in Christ Jesus, you have the potential to receive everything that God has for you. Ooh, I like that. I'm going to try one more time, uh, Dick and Fun Bird. Listen, y'all. If you're in Christ Jesus, everything God has for you, he's put it in Christ. So that if you have Christ in you, everything God has for you is at your disposal. Now, this means you are suited or prepared for good works. But, but, but how many of you know I said the Holy Spirit got to do a work? Now, people, the Holy Spirit is the customs inspector. Anybody go pray with me? Any of y'all ever been out of the country? And you had your little passport with you? And you was coming back into the country? Anybody go pray with me? And they needed to see your passport? Tell somebody the Holy Spirit is my passport to heaven. But the Holy Spirit is also my passport to be down here and live like I'm already in heaven. So now listen now, but it's something else about the uh, passport. How many of y'all, when, when you came back into the country, you showed the passport, but it was a men or women walked up on the side there, and people call them custom inspectors. And they want to inspect you to make sure you don't bring nothing illegal into the country. The Holy Spirit is your custom inspector. Now somebody say he give me a warning. Number one, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit imputes you with righteousness. Now listen to this. When he imputes you with righteousness, 
It's there. However, if you don't believe it, it might as well not be there. He imputes you with a new identity. But if you don't want to believe it, you will stay the same. He injects you, infuses you with new power to do the thing you couldn't do before. But if you don't want to believe it, you're going to do the same thing. And to show you that the power is available, he sent trials your way. If you work in the old man, you're going to respond to it the same way you did in 1954. Come on, talk to me in here. But if you tune into the new man, you're going to cause people to leave you scratching their heads. When you get in the new man, you don't have to worry about getting new friends. You ain't got to worry about old friends. When you get in the new man, everything that's not like the new man is going to be offended when they get around. Any of y'all ever been somewhere and folks were doing things that you didn't like and it grieved your spirit? Any of y'all ever been grieved in the spirit? See, that's the new man. But the good thing about it, how many of y'all ever told somebody or somebody told you, you ain't like you used to be? You ever heard somebody say, well, uh, I ain't what I want to be? But I showed up ain't what I used to. Come on, help me in here, y'all. What are they talking about? In other words, even though I look the same, there's something spiritual and radically going on inside me that's changing me from the inside out that I things I want to do, I just don't. Uh, come on, help me, y'all. Uh, in other words, there's some things that I would love to do. But there's new power that comes up when I want to do wrong that said, boy, you got to do right and the righteousness is impute and all of a sudden I'm walking in it. Now, Deacon Whipper, here it is. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. 2 Corinthians 4 and 7 is, or it's 4 and 17. In earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. In other words, Paul makes it plain. There's an earthen vessel, and the earthen vessel is us. All we are are vessels. But there's a treasure that's in the vessel. Anybody go pray with me? Deacon Wade is Deacon Wade. He saved and God cleaned out the vessel inside and out so that he can put the new treasure in. However, Deacon Wade need to understand, just like that picture, the reason Jesus is in the vessel is that when he acts, when he behaves, when he responds, he's going to cause people to see Jesus. Because Jesus is in the vessel. You're a new person, but you're a new person because you've been joined to him. It's him that God's trying to make you like. See, God's plan is that when I see Deacon Thompson, I see Jesus. When I see Minister Bridges, I see Jesus. When I see Dr. Jackie, I see Jesus. When I see Minister Loretta, I see Jesus. When I see Deacon Rowland and Sister Vicky, I see Jesus. In other words, we were birthed in the order of Christ. So God is trying to make you and I look just like Jesus and he's trying to get us to act like Jesus. So when we do something, somebody say, woo wee. Give God some praise because I know that wasn't him that did it. He couldn't do that. The only person can do that is Jesus. And look at it, it's my last point and I'm through. Listen to me, y'all. Two and ten, last part which God has before ordained that we should walk in there. How many of y'all know you're not saved by your works? The only work you can do for God is to kill yourself. That's all he's asking you to do. Somebody ought to help me with that one. 
God said, the only thing I need you to do to help me is to kill off that old man that just keep creeping around. You take care of him. Anybody going to say anything? Now listen, so that we've been created in Christ Jesus to produce good works. Again, God did it in us. Jesus did it for us. The Holy Spirit doing it in us, and now what's in us got to come out. Are y'all with me? You are spiritually programmed because of what God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit did. You are created now to produce good works, the same good works that God did when he created the world. So everything in you has the potential to be good. Tell somebody, I got the potential to be good. And he says, good folk, God has before a day that we should walk in them, meaning before the foundation of the world, God established things for you to accomplish. They already been mapped out. You already shaped in goodness. All he's asking you to do is walk in what he has put before you. In other words, he's saying get in the spirit and put one foot in front of the other and soon you'll be walking into the works of God. Help me, Holy Ghost. Put one foot in front of the other and soon you will be walking into the good works of God. Now what is included in the good works? Think about the children of Israel. God knew they was going to go in bondage. God knew they was going to be mistreated. God knew he was going to free them. God knew they was going to the Red Sea. He knew the Red Sea was going to be high that they couldn't cross. God knew they were going to get to the land of Canaan and see giants in there and be afraid to go in. Now, the reason it's this way Romans 8 and 26 says, and we know. Anybody going to pray with me? And we know. What do we know? That God will work to the good all things for those who love him and are called according to his prayer. People, how many times did Moses ask the Pharaoh, to free them. Did he free them the first time? But did Moses quit? How many of y'all understand when God tells you to do something and you get to somebody and they say no? Tell somebody that's just part of the scripture that you can see that the scripture really works. People listen. How many of y'all can remember when your car was real dirty and you started washing your car and you washed a portion of your car but the remainder of the car was still dirty but you continue to wash till it was clean what did you do you made that which was unclean and you worked it into being clean god is saying if you broke and in poverty that's all right, because I'm going to work that thing to your good. If you get a setback, you already know it positions you for your combat. If you got a shut door, all that means God is going to open another door. If you face adversity, all that means God's got a new appointment with you for a new destiny. But tell somebody, don't quit. Things get confused. Doesn't seem you can make it. Don't quit. Go to Romans 8 and 26 and say, I know that God is working this thing to my good. 
Right now it looks bad. Don't look like I'm going nowhere, but I'm going to keep, I'm going to hang in there and I'm going to do just like Broadwater said. I'm going to start praising God to that door open up for me. How many of y'all know praise that can cause some things to happen for you? How many of you know if you're in a bad situation, if you start praising God, the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. If you would just praise God, he would come on the scene. And when he come on the scene, tell somebody things began to change. Come on, stand on your feet and give God a praise if you know what I'm talking about. Come on, give God a hand wave. And no matter what you're going to face next week, remember you more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. And are you a conqueror in some things? Many things. Most things. Nay, you're a conqueror in all things. Tell somebody I'm a conqueror in all things, in money things, in health things, in weak things. I am more than a conqueror through God that strengthens me. Raise your hand if you feel good. Raise your hand if you feel the power of God in your body now. Come on, get God a praise if you got the victory right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I know I have the victory. You got the victory. As we get ready to be the miss, you may be sitting. You got the victory. I want you to be encouraged. Stay excited and be on fire for the Lord. And don't let the devil steal your joy. When you move to do good and he moved to do bad, remember you God's masterpiece and God's going to cause you to shine. Amen. We sincerely love you all. And it's an undescribable blessing just to be able to see you because you just like us would have never believed we would live in a time where we were out of church for a whole year. So it's joy and power with seeing the saints of God. Let's come to our feet, get a Lord a hand praise, and we're going to give you the benediction. Amen. Gracious Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we ask, O oh God, that you allow your presence and your power to rest upon your people. Father, we say a special prayer for all those that are sick, O oh God, for, for Minister and Deaconess Heron's son, for Sister Isoline, O oh God, we pray for your visitation of healing to come down upon them with your anointing, O oh God and you make them whole. We ask that you be with your people as they engage this next week. Give them the patience and the faith, oh God, to endure and receive your blessings. Bless them spiritually, bless them physically, and bless them financially with the things they need, oh God. Cause a smile to be upon them, oh God. We thank you for Sister McKnight's testimony today, God, that you still have the last word. You're still raising the dead. You're still healing the sick, and you still can open blind eyes. And we thank you, God. And what I say to one, I say to all, watch, pray, live holy every day. In Jesus' name, you are dismissed.